Mr. David Devan. Hello. How are you, sir? I'm fine. I'm good. Good, good, good. I love that tie. Thank you. <laughs> I stole it from my husband this morning. Yeah. <laughs> right. Do you, so you just keep it to ties, right? You were just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't take the same size, so we're we don't we're good. Yeah. Um, ties. Uh, we have an extensive collection of bow ties. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, he favors the bow ties, and so I usually steal those. But right. today I stole a long tie. Right. <laughs> and I I read that you are a uh, fan of suits. I am. When did that start? Um, when I moved to Philly. So I came. Oh, okay. to, I moved here from Victoria, British Columbia. Right. Was recruited here, and on the west coast, um, you suits is not something that you necessarily have to wear every day. Well, listen, I'm from Portland, Oregon. Yeah, so you so. get it. You totally get it. So, you know, Gore-Tex. Uh, yes. <laughs> I had more Gore-Tex. Um, and I remember the search consultant saying you need to go buy a really nice pair of leather shoes mm. um, and go get a new suit. Uh, so I did. Um, yeah. And there it started. So I have a bit of a suit fetish. Yeah. Um, How many suits, may I ask, do you have in your closet? I don't know. Like... Over a hundred? No, not that many. Not okay. that many. Not that many. No, because well, and the thing is, is that the fashions have changed, and the the you know the um, cuts get narrower yeah. and shorter and stuff. So I would say, like at any one time, there's like twenty five mm. suits, mm-hmm. but they're. There's a rotation plan, right? Um, uh, so I have a I purchase um, one to new two new suits per winter season and per summer season, Fun. and then that and then something goes out the door, yeah, um, yeah. and gets donated, right? Um, and it's just uh, and we started doing so much work in Europe. And so our music director's um, Italian, um, and when he's not living in Philly, uh, lives in northern Italy, um, which happens to be the fashion capital of yes, the world. Sir. Um, so I do have um, two places in Milan and two places in Bergamo uh, that <gasps> um, I'm now largely buying my suits from. Um, wow. So, yeah. And then I'm also a suit supply guy, which is just around the corner, yeah. and they're great for summer suits, um, corduroy things, this right. sort of stuff. Yeah. Right. So what's the what's – the, we're going to move on from <laughs> – suits in a minute. <laughs> but what is the craziest, most fun suit that you have right now? Um, I think, um, so last year, no, two years ago, I bought my first bespoke suit. Yes. Um, and I got this fantastic check materials, oh, British yeah. wool, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then it has like a fuchsia lining. Okay. Um, and I wear it with like a pink shirt and a purple bow tie. Um, and it sounds garish, but it's not. It's really natty. So <laughs> um, I think that's probably. And then in the winter, I've got this great three-piece tweed thing, mm-hmm. um, which is, um, is sort of a little bit of a showstopper. Um, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, and I then want... I have a lot of black, gray, and navy like every other guy. <laughs> But you throw some fun in there. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, I want to thank you for being on the show. Um, you know, Opera Philadelphia was probably, I just moved here, right, from Welcome. Chicago. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. And when I got here and I got on uh, Broad Street, which is the main street, um, Avenue of the Arts, Avenue right? Avenue of the Arts. I saw banners that just said, oh. Right. Right. And I was very <laughs> curious because I was like, Oh, <laughs> Philadelphia <laughs> does not have any O's. <laughs> yeah. What is this O? Right. And then I got a chance to speak with uh, Sarah Williams. I had mm-hmm. her on the show. Yeah. And then I got a chance. Who's our new works administrator. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Brilliant person. Yep. She is. And I got a chance to go attend O18, which is your baby. And yeah. the Opera Philadelphia's, you know, I mean, groundbreaking project. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that. Great. Um, but first, I want to know you as a person, right? Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> so you are, where are you from? So I'm from, originally from Toronto. Uh, Toronto, Canada. as Torontonians right. would say. So it's they Toronto. So, yeah, so it's Toronto, but Torontonians don't pronounce the last T, so it's Toronto. 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 So if you're from Toronto, you say Toronto. If okay, you're not okay. from Toronto, you say Toronto. Toronto. <laughs> um, uh, so and but I was I moved here from Victoria, British Columbia. Yes. Where I was running the opera company there, mm-hmm. um, and uh, met my husband, who was 
and not my husband at the time, of course. Um, and then we moved to Philly in 2006. Okay, okay. What did your parents do? Uh, my father owned a water osmosis building uh, 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 company, um, which is a water purification. Okay, thing. it's a small residential thing. It's not like not s- serving water to the world or anything. <laughs> um, and my mother um, is uh, was uh, ran a retraining job retraining program, okay. and she also is a fearless advocate for the homeless. And she wow. um, started a not for profit in her community in Northern Ontario um, called a place called home, uh, which right. um, provides housing for people um, in transition who are homeless to get them into permanent housing. Wow. So she's a fierce advocate in Canada for um, homeless resources for the homeless. Yeah, that's very admirable. So we have um, a bit of a homeless problem in the States, right? We do. What is it like in Canada? Um, it's a little more undercover. Okay. Um, there are still there are still homeless. Like my my parents live in a community of fourteen thousand people. Yeah. So you don't think you think oh homelessness is a big city problem. Mm. And she discovered that homelessness is pervasive. Yeah. Um, and there's always um, so many times through no fault of the individuals, um, homelessness can become um, a permanent way of life. Yeah. Um, and so I'd say in Canada, there's a more of a safety net, okay. uh, social safety net mm-hmm. um, than there is in this country. Um, and as such, um, it's far more visible here. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just in general, the difference between Canada is there's more of a social safety net mm-hmm. f- across the board. Right. Yeah. So what was it like gro- uh, growing up for you? Good childhood? Um, yeah, okay. Um, what, what made it okay? Um, so I grew up in uh, Fenland Falls, um, which is a town of 1,800 people in northern Ontario. Yeah. So um, the thing you need to know about um, northern Ontario and Canada, small towns, is it, it, it revolves 100% around hockey. <laughs> so um, that's not like an exaggeration. No. Um, <laughs> so um, – and my brother was a prolific – hockey player. Um, My dad was the hockey coach. I, however, was a male figure skater. And so um, you were relentlessly teased. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, stories of hiding your skates in the snowbank, um, you know. uh, And so I essentially hated living in this small town. Right, yeah. Um, And uh, and so – I had a loving family. I got to pursue a sport that I loved, mm-hmm. um, but um, the my quality of childhood was tainted um, by being the town ferry skater. And I subsequently learned that my father was chastised um, uh, by other fathers for letting his son right, um, right. ferry skate. So. Um, yeah. Now, the good side of that was mm-hmm. um, I have I developed at a very young age resolve, um, yeah. and because I never thought of quitting skating, isn't that weird? Like, wouldn't that you is just weird. quit? I was just about to ask. It's just like, why wouldn't you just quit and make everything go easy? Yeah. Um, and so I think that um, I think that taught me a lot. Um, just in terms of um, doing what you think is right, mm. even when other people think it's wrong. Right. Um, and certainly that served me well in life and it served me well professionally. Yeah. Um, the other thing about skating is I joke that, you know, skating prepared me to being the general director of an opera company because, you know, you're skating on one sixteenth of an inch of metal at high speed. You throw your body in the air. Yeah. Um, Believing that you will land it and most often crashing. Um, and right. then you just get up and you do it again. And uh, and so I think that's um, created a perspective on risk for me that is different from um, many of my colleagues. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I'm used to crashing. That's a very valuable lesson. Yeah. Um, so – when did you learn that your father was also like chastised? Oh, when I was like thirty-two. I oh, mean, okay. like I was just so you didn't know. I was just like this. bitching about like this town, yeah. Which is, if anyone from Fenland Falls is listening, <laughs> I mean, it's a lovely town, and I've actually gone back. Um, my husband and I have gone back, yeah. And I had so many fond memories mm. when I went back as an adult and 
looking at the waterfalls because it's called Fenland Falls. Right. Um, so there's nothing wrong with the town per se. I just, I was just a square, it was a square peg round hole. And yeah. it was at a time when I think, um, you know, there's a, just a narrow view of what the world could be. And that happens in small towns sometimes. Okay. Okay. Um, but anyways, I was complaining at some like Christmas family dinner or yeah. something about, and, and then my father, you know, said that he was te- like, you know, that the, the other fathers when, so if I were, on, if I was on the ice skating at practice and then my brother's team was ready to be the hockey team next. Right. right? Yeah. So that he would, he would get chastised by the other fathers. Wow. Um, and, but I didn't find that out until I was 32. I mean, and I didn't ever mention to my parents once that I was teased, um, that, um, life was, um, hard for me in any way, um, uh, because it, I, I didn't want to have to stop, and I just didn't think it was anyone's problem but mine. And it, and it wasn't like I had other things going for me. I was a really bright student. Mm. Um, I was well liked by teachers and some of the st- some of the kids at school. So it yeah. wasn't like a desolate situation. Um, but when people ask me about my upbringing, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, okay. But it's interesting that you guys decided not to tell each other, right? right? And so how has that affected your relationship today? Like With a pa- my parents? With or the, your yeah. dad, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, we're the, so tight. Um, we're yeah. just, I love my parents. Right. They're wildly supportive. Um, uh, they um, love and accept my husband, whose name is also David. Um, the two Davids, the Davids. Yes, yes. The Davids. <laughs> and... Um, uh, yeah, and they were super supportive of my skating, mm-hmm. and um, and yeah, and every, we all recognize that sometimes hardships um, bring benefits, and long as you're in a loving environment, yeah, you can face them, and that's exactly my life lesson. Yeah. So, were there other um, males like doing figure skating? One. One. Yeah. Okay, and then everybody else was female. Yes. Okay. Okay. Wow. So, did you like develop a relationship with? That guy? Um, a little bit. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He was, um, we weren't similar personalities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. Okay. So then what, you pursued figure skating like pretty hardcore. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I, um, I was um, both an individual skater and a pair skater. Yeah. And so trained at the National Pair School and. Um, National Pair School. Yeah. So, um, uh, so I, no, it was, it was something like I spent, you know. Uh, more time on the ice than I did in a classroom yeah. <laughs> in grades like nine, ten, and eleven. <laughs> um, and then I and then I retired from skating at nineteen, and I taught for uh, a couple of years, and then I went to school. So I had a gap year between high school and university, yeah. and then I went to, and I applied to dance schools and to business schools. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, my father thought I should apply to business schools because I was I happened to be very good at math. So um, in, I don't know, just in a weak moment, I decided to go to business school and got a finance degree and uh, was um, then thinking about my next move. And um, one of the um, professors I had knew that I'd come from the skating background. I'd taken some electives in the dance department mm. and suggested I consider doing an MBA in arts administration. Okay. And I was like, arts administration people make money at arts really what's going on <laughs> so i decided i should probably go talk to somebody that did said job for before sure. i invested in doing a graduate degree smart and i um got an information interview at the canadian opera company okay and donna lynn coots was the director of administration and yeah. she did the information interview and she had an mba from harvard worked for um mcdonald detweiler then harvard mba then mckinsey and company okay um and now found herself as the director of administration of the Canadian Opera Company. Anyways, um, she hired me um, as the first and only ever marketing analyst um, uh, for an <laughs> opera company doing regression <laughs> analysis and all this stuff. And of course, uh, after six months, I ran out of numbers to crunch um, and they made me the director of marketing. Um, right. Like 25 or 26, running the largest subscription program in Canada. Um, and I fell in love with opera. I'd never seen one. Really? Um, well, and uh, so then I went to uh, the then general director, Brian mm. Dickey, after about a year of this and said, hey, I really love 
opera. So I have a proposal. Um, I'll stay for the next four years and I'll work my fanny off as I have as a director of marketing, right. you know, my usual 60, 70 hours. But on top of that, I would like to be seconded to every one of the artistic departments um, over, okay. the, over the course of that time. Yeah. Um, and he said, yes. Wow. Um, and that's what I did. And he's continued to be a mentor of mine mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, to this very day. Yeah. Um, uh, and he really sort of taught me about um, the form. Mm. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's how I ended up in opera from skating to dance through business right. school. <laughs> Just like so <laughs> what did you originally, before you ever got into opera, the world of opera, right? Mm-hmm. What did you think of opera? I didn't know it. Mm. Yeah. Like, I, I literally had no idea. Yeah. Like, it was, you know, I was all about dance. Um, it's about modern dance, mm-hmm. and that was my sort of aesthetic thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, I went to dance. I loved dance. I did dance. And then I heard opera, and I'm like, oh, my God, what is this? It's yeah. like a mess. Yeah. Um, it was the first production was Madama Butterfly in 1989. Um, Susan Benson designed, Brian McDonald directed, Yoko Watanabe as Butterfly, and I was a crying hot mess um, But what was it about? It. What was about it? What was about... Um, what was it about that performance? Yeah, so I figured it out. Um, so the reason why... So if you think about it, this ties to the skating. So sk- skating is essentially this virtuosic kind of activity, right? Mm-hmm. You you literally slot, uh, glide on um, one-sixteenth of an inch of metal. Right. Um, it's uh, high-risk you know, it's so sort of like landing the triples like the high C. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Like yeah. there's a virtuosic activity about it. So I think what drew me to opera was it is like one of the most ultimate virtuosic mm. experiences from a performance point of view for the performer. And I could really relate to that. Right. Um, and that's what draws me in. And if you look at all the curatorial choices we make here yeah. at Opera Philadelphia, there's a through line about um, – exploring and really leaning in and amplifying the virtuosity Mm. of vocal performance. Right. Because, yeah, that's an important part to stress, I think, because Mm -hmm. when we think of opera, virtuosity, for me at least, is not necessarily the first thing that comes to mind. Right. right? Um, But by showing... But when you experience it, it is a... Absolutely, part of the it's experience. crazy, right? It's crazy, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and so I think that's um, that's sort of the emotional space that I connected to opera with, and it's informed my professional choices and my mm. professional mm. work okay. um, in many ways. And then the other thing is, is because I didn't have formal training in the form, yeah, I don't, I don't have. Um, the same traditions as life experience that a lot of people that do my job. Right. Which I think has um, also been part of just the amount of innovation that we do here. Yeah. Um, because there's not a tethering to. Now, we have lots of people on staff that have deep and meaningful mm-hmm. <laughs> histories in the form, yeah. and I need them here. Um, but I think my intentions to sort of push the inquiry about what the form can be through the artist. Yeah. Um, one of the things that allows that to happen is because I don't have a long technical history with the form. Right, right. So what's interesting about that is that I find that most people would be the opposite. They would not be, like for you, um, you take it as a positive that you don't really have a, background in right. opera. Yeah, and to make sure we've hired people that, you know, in our music department and our right. music director that have deep and meaningful right. histories. But for most most people, that would be like a kind of, um, it would plant a seed of doubt in their mind. Yeah. Did it ever oh, yeah. for you? <laughs> it did, totally. <laughs> yeah, completely. It hasn't been really until like the last five years that I've become 
confident in my abilities to lead an opera organization. Last five years? Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. So there is a lot of uh, a doubt, and, be, and a lot of my instincts aren't traditional instincts. Um, yeah. But, you know, back to the skating example in the small town, it was like, well, it didn't stop me, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, but um, it, it did uh, it, it did take a long time. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think – and what aided that was um, the team here is so fantastic, um, our – artistic team. And so part of m- me finding confidence in it is that um, working with them mm. and us all finding out that we have different things we bring to the party yeah. and that my um, almost sort of quirky um, attitudes towards inquiry is something that they really embrace Right, um, is great. And then we've just had a lot of success. Yeah. So, you know, our track record on the new works Yes, sir. Um, significant, mm-hmm. uh, and so you, you know, if, if you have some degree of self awareness, yeah. <laughs> you might go, "Oh, I had something to do with that." Yeah. Right? I'm not crazy. Right? Um, okay. Yeah. So you come to Opera Philadelphia in 2005, right? 2006, January 2006. 1st. 2006 is the day we moved. Okay. From Victoria to Philadelphia. What made you... I was hired in 2005, but I arrived in 2006. Right. What made you take that leap? <laughs> um, so um, it was very interesting. So I got a call from the search consultants. Right. Um, and I declined to apply. They were looking really? for... Really? Why? Well, I'll tell you. So they were looking for a managing director. And the way the job description read, it was like they were looking for somebody to basically ask people for money, um, and which I do, and I have done. Yes. Um, but... For me, it's that that that's a asking for money and and doing fundraising is an outcome of doing something important. Okay, um, and I didn't see that important thing, so I said no. And I was still working. I we'd really done great things in Victoria, and there were just a couple other things I wanted to see through. And I just met the other David. Right. So it was like, eh, you know, you've been through enough bad relationships. When you get a good one, you're like, but it had only been like, we met in July. So it only, when they started, they came, they inquired in September. And so we'd only met in July. So it had only been three months. But you knew this, this David was the guy. Pretty much. Okay. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, so I say no for all those reasons. Yeah. Um, and so they begged me to come. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, eh, I'm cycling with my father. Oh, no, it was in August because it was the summer. I was cycling with my father um, from uh, Montreal to the Gaspé. It was a big, long bike trip. Wow. So I said, I'll come and visit you on my way back from the Gaspé. Yeah. And so I arrive in Philadelphia with like – panniers, like, you know, the bike panniers and <laughs> no suit. I had to go buy khakis at Banana Republic. Really, yeah. um, and then I go to the interview, which was just going to be a toss away. And then I was going to go. But then I started talking to the people who were really earnest. Mm. Um, and it also became clear that this, the, the, it was called the Opera Company of Philadelphia at the time, and that the Opera Company of Philadelphia was the most Underrealized opera company in any major American city. Yeah, and I thought, hmm, maybe this is an opportunity to build a different kind of opera enterprise in a major market. Yes, that's never going to come along. The, and it yeah. was, and and a lot of the reason why the company was. Um, sort of underdeveloped relative to its peers in other cities wasn't because anyone was doing anything bad, but um, they didn't really have access to the Academy of Music, which is the Opera House, until 2001 when the Kimmel Center was built because okay. the Philadelphia Orchestra owns the Academy and they were performing. So, right. it, so I, you know, like there's earnest, committed people in a unique situation. Mm. And so I then became... Very serious. Okay. Um, and that's why I took the job. Yeah. And I took the job as managing director. I kind of reframed the job that they 
we're applying for and mm -hmm. said, if you want someone to help reinvent the company, I'm in. If you want someone to just ask for money, I'm out. Yeah. Um, so they said yes. And the idea was that I would come in as managing director. Robert Driver was then the general director and that we would use a number of years to transition into me being the general director. Mm -hmm. And we put a time limit of five years on that. And wow. in five years, I was made the general director. Um, and... Um, and it was, it was the right way to go because I needed to learn Philadelphia. I needed to learn the U.S. market. Yeah. I needed to fix a bunch of administrative things mm -hmm. that um, just really needed fixing. Um, and it was a way for me to start putting um, some sort of fingerprints on right. sort of what the artistic practice was and, right. and learn. Because I think, you know, Opera Philadelphia, the – the turnaround and the change in my tenure here has been about evolution, not revolution. And mm -hmm. I think coming in as the managing director allowed me to engage in an evolutionary process right. versus trying to spark a revolution. Yeah. From the outside, it looks a bit like a revolution because people see, you know, it's 2018. And so people look and go, oh, since 2012, it's been like a revolution. But yeah, for sure. I've been here for six years leading up to it. So internally, it was an evolution, even okay. though in the marketplace, it looks like we've led a yeah. revolution. Yeah. So what is the first step to, as the managing director, you get here on the first day of the job, and you know that you have to like start turning the ship around. What's right. the first step? So what I've always done in these sorts of situations is you need to... Um, <laughs> I'll say, you need to come up with a magic decoder ring um, <laughs> that everybody carries a note and has an idea about what that um, turnaround point is about, what you're going to accomplish. Right. So at the time, you know, there were large players surrounding us, mm. established players, Philadelphia Orchestra, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Opera. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a Canadian coming to Philadelphia and going, this is the birthplace of America. We need to represent yeah. America. For sure. Um, and we need to own our real estate in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And as a non-American at the time, um, I became an American citizen in January. Congratulations. Um, thank you. I felt the need to vote. <laughs> um, oh, my God. So, um, uh, so in any event, I... Um, uh, uh, the thing that America, the reason I moved to the country and w what was appealing about it was this uh, sort of relentless pursuit of innovation. That mm. There's just always this sort of attempt at progress. Right. <laughs> um, and so we started quickly in the first six months talking about that. And then we became clear that – and I've always used analogies – in my um, senior work when I've taken over a company to figure out an analogy that people will understand. That's the magic Dakota ring part. <laughs> so so the, 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 the um, analogy was um, if we were television, mm -hmm. we're not gonna try to be network, this is back in 2006, remember, yeah. we're not gonna be network television. That's where we're gonna let all the, the big guys do. Right. Um, we're gonna become we're going to behave like a specialty channel and we're going to become the HBO of opera. And everybody got behind that. And then you could start literally going, would HBO do that? Um, right. That was your model, right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, if we do the same thing in Victoria, you know, it was like, we're going to be Glyndebourne of the West in terms of wanting to um, have a particular sort of jewel box like quality and, and a certain scale of operation. So, um, and uh, so that's, that was the start. And that's what l led us um, on a track to change and um, pursue quality, but think about quality in different terms. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so in any, any place that I've been, I've always tried to figure out that analogy yeah. that is the guiding strategic force. And you usually need to come up with that in the first six months while you're in the honeymoon phase. Right. Um, uh, and if you don't, you just miss the opportunity. That's not going to come around again. No. Okay, okay. So talk to me about the path to um, 
What is the path to the thought of turning like an opera company into like an HBO or a Netflix? Yeah. So yeah, because now we've moved. So the world's changed. So our festival, it has changed, oh, right? right? Like yeah. 018 is we uh, I explain it as a, a. It's sort of like the Sundance of opera yeah. um, festival, um, and we've Netflixed the opera consumption model right. by allowing binge watching in this highly dense um, festival. Um, and you know, one of the. Um, I mean. I talked to a brand insight person to help with this, okay. and and they were the ones that actually gave me the HBO handle. Yeah. Um, and you know, and then as we approach through past '08 and into '09 and '10, it became very clear that we needed to think of ourselves as a media choice. Mm, um, mm. You have lots of choices right. in terms of media you can consume, and we need to be one of those choices. Yeah. Um, and we have something to bring to the party that's unique in terms of virtuosity and connection to community and all that right. sort of stuff, coolness, hopefully, um, happening, feeling of a happening. Mm. Um, so like Bonnaroo sort of kind of yeah. um, thing. So, um, uh and but how did we get there in oh six oh seven? Um, was really I, through this brand insight person that um, gave me that insight. Mm-hmm. So I've always chosen to work, um, try to find the smartest people in the room that don't work in my field, yeah, um, and try to ask them to come in and give me perspective, right? Um, and. Uh, Maureen was one of those people, and she's been with us ever since. She does all of our qualitative research. Mm, mm. Um, and she was part one of the um, great um, assisters <laughs> in coming up with the festival concept. Yeah. So what's what I find fascinating about your thinking is that you rely on analytics, right, way more than what I've found in, like, arts organizations. <laughs> there seems to be – I mean, obviously, I'm not – in like an arts administration role, so mm-hmm. I can't say this for sure. But to the outside eye, it looks like arts organizations are kind of reluctant to reach out to people who are outside of the arts. Yeah, I don't know whether that's um, – there are not a lot of people outside the arts working in arts. Right. Um, so whether or not they're reluctant or not, I don't know Yeah. because I don't, I'm not them. Um, but I do think the issue is is that – Arts institutions are radically undercapitalized. Mm. What do I mean by that? It yes. means they, they don't have um, enough free cash mm-hmm. to um, luxuriate in experiments, yeah. um, anything other than putting on the art and putting a bum in the seat. Right. So if you look at um, the spend um, and the financial investments of – Art, not-for-profit arts organizations, there's virtually no money for research mm. and there's virtually no money for analytics right. because they're undercapitalized. So they're not saying they're bad people or they don't, they're don't. they not interested in having other people come in. But if they have someone come in to help them, they're going to take someone from the industry that's going to be able to do it quicker, cheaper, yeah. because every dollar they have has to go to produce the art and putting a bum in the seat mm. or a person through the turnstile if they're a museum. Um, and so, so I just think that's the reality of undercapitalized arts organizations. Okay. Okay. Um, and there's no public subsidy. There's no, you know, there's no money that shows up unless you have these huge endowments, which very few arts organizations have, especially performing arts. So what we did um, was that we were able to work with the Pew Charitable Trust yes. and get a dedicated. Um, grant for research and analytics mm-hmm. um, that we couldn't spend on anything else, yeah. um, which was great. Um, and that just completely changed the DNA of the company. Yeah. So now we, have, we were just crazy robust in terms of analytics. Right. Um, we have ongoing, we spent over half a million dollars in primary market research. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no arts consultants within <laughs> hundred mile radius. I mean, we use Coca-Cola segmentation company yeah. and Netflix brand insight company and Disney's uh, qualitative firm. So, I mean, um, 
but also even internally our business and we have a bi we have a bi uh, we have a robust bi operation which is business intelligence mm-hmm. um it runs out of our, our cfo has built it um and uh people come in and see the kind of analytics we're running in real time and their jaws are on the floor yeah um and it's not to be cool analytics it's to help us make decisions. Right. And one of the other big insights, which is a lot of people get freaked out about our um, focus on analytics because they're concerned that, you know, that we're giving up uh, artistic mission and yeah. curatorial responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and people, I think, are afraid a little bit of market research because what happens if the market research tells them that they're doing the wrong thing, which is ex- what ours did. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's but, a big one. But um, for us, the data has actually um, spurred us on to be um, curatorially aggressive um, right, right. Because what we learned through the research is, is dumbing down s- stuff is not a way to build an audience. Mm-hmm. Smarting things up yeah. is required, and you need a wider product portfolio so that you can have your own on-ramp. You on the other side of the camera can have your own on-ramp. You behind the camera operating it can decide what's best for you. I can go, and guess what? I can't predict what anything. I have no idea what you went to in our festival. And I bet you whatever I guess is probably the wrong thing because Mm. it's about you. Right. So our research um, actually liberated us. Yeah to um, actually be better artistic leaders. So it's the whole Steve Jobs thing, right? right? Like people don't know what they want until they see it. They see it. And it's gotta be something that they can't, it has to be beyond what they thought was possible. Right. Well, so when you when you saw the results of the analysis, right? And you saw that the company was doing kind of like the wrong things. right? That was like a holy shit moment, right? Yeah. Well, and one of the things, so one of the things we'd already been on the HBO front, we'd already created, um, had a new work practice. Um, we would increased quality, but we weren't getting the results we wanted. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a, there were these cliff charts that were the WTF moment mm. of what am I doing? I'm doing all the things by the playbook and we're not getting the return sticky customer that everyone says we should. And we do the research and it's like, well, it's because you're packaging and selling things wrong um, and you don't have a a wide enough product portfolio. Um, And so, yeah, we had to change everything. Uh, We had to change our marketing systems. We had to change our our production um, systems. We had to change our venues. We had to change our box office. We had to change how we raise money. Yeah. We, um, I, you know, the board had to evolve. Um, and I think when I was at something and people were talking about our research, um, and in, in the introduction, um, introducing me to talk about this, um, they, they said that the thing that they thought was remarkable about us wasn't the fact that we did research was the fact that we actually listened to the research and when it said we had to change everything we did. Right. And right. that and and therein lies issue. And our and our and our our world, the opera world has been not the opera, the arts world, performing arts world has been built on a subscription model mm-hmm. and what we call a development pyramid yeah. for fifty years. Um, and that that selling paradigm is no longer valid in the marketplace. Right. So what we're trying to do is um, to go to where the market is mm-hmm. going. So my best Canadian analogy is Wayne Gretzky's famous line of the reason why he's such a great hockey player is because he skates to where the puck is going to be, not <laughs> to where it is. Okay. And so as a company, we've tried to skate to where the puck is going. Is going. Okay. Um, but to find a um, uh, exciting um, curatorial mm. practice yeah. in that that's actually helping define the future of the form. Right, right. So this is what year when you did the the, the research? Um, well, it's it. There's no one year. It's like an on- ongoing. It's ongoing. Thing. But we started in 2000 and. 
either late 11 or early t- 2012 on detailed transactional analysis, okay. which okay. led to these cliff charts um, that I thought it was going to slip my wrist. Um, and that <laughs> led us to going to Pew to say, hey, can we get some advancement money to do yeah. this research? Yeah. And they said yes. Okay. So while you guys are doing and this. And we keep going. Like we just got the data from 018, the quantitative data from 018. Oh, really? Two days ago. Um, and um, so it's ongoing. Okay, um, yeah. And we, you know, we measure our net promoter scores. We do all this mm-hmm. sort of detailed analytics. Um, and I haven't been briefed on them yet. So okay. um, I, I don't know what they say. I, I don't know what it says yet, but uh, that happens on, uh, next week. Okay. <laughs> the marketing team, the marketing team's gone through it. Yeah. With uh, Cicero, the research firm. Okay. So while you're going, while Opera Philadelphia is doing all this research, right? The Philadelphia Orchestra files for bankruptcy. Correct. What was that like seeing that? Um, it was hard yeah. for everybody. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, but in many, in much the same way, they were dealing with the challenges just in a different way. Yeah. They had some systemic things in their institution that they needed to fix, and bankruptcy was a way to do that. Mm-hmm. We as um, an underdeveloped company didn't have big built up structural issues we had to deal with. Right. So um, we continued in our startup mentality yeah. Yeah. <laughs> through this research, you know, sort of like, you know, the app developer is doing that while IBM's trying to refigure out their business right. because there's a, a, a big thing. So, you know, um, we um, were, of course, good colleagues um, and uh, it wasn't really our place to be supportive, but we certainly didn't work against them. Yeah. Um, and, and I think what happened unintentionally in the marketplace during that time is that it cre- and the barns was just being built. So I think, you know, that – so you've got major orchestra and bankruptcy. The barns has just been built mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. on the parkway. There's this emerging scrappy opera company that's yeah. getting a lot of notice. And what it did was sort of just broaden the um, – people's understanding about what arts in Philadelphia could be. Um, And I I think that was just an ecological outcome Mm. of that. Um, But for for us, we were just hopeful that um, it was going to be successful because um, we want there to be a Philadelphia orchestra in Philadelphia. For sure, (laughs) for sure. Okay, let's talk about Festival O. Yeah. Right. Opera Philadelphia is now one of, if not the leader of commissioning new opera. We have the largest contemporary opera practice in the country. What led that? um, It was back to the HBO. So if you're HBO and you're going to define the genre, you better get out in front of new programming. Right, 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 right. You know, HBO didn't become HBO just because they were, like, showing old movies. They became HBO because they developed thoughtful, provocative programming that wasn't anywhere in in the television universe. They created a new market category. And so our logic was that we wanted to make a, a discernible commitment to new American opera because we're the birthplace of America. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. we started the American Repertoire Program, which was our commitment to do one new American opera every year for the next 10 years. We overshot the target into year four. Um, (laughs) But the other thing we did, which was unique, um, was we did, did, back to the analytics, we did sort of an analysis of new opera from 1920 through to the year 2000. Yeah. Um, and we started analyzing how many pieces were written in that time period that became part of the canon. Mm. It was very small. Okay. Um, and then we looked to see what happened in the previous century, mm-hmm. and it was very high. Right. Now, tastes were different, blah, blah, blah. But the one thing that we unearthed um, was the idea that composers um, – leading up to 1920, had the benefit of publishers and patrons that supported them Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, more than one piece. So they were like 
work and churn almost, right? right? And out of that, you had some stinkers and you had some good ones, but you just like the math of the situation says you need to write a bunch of stuff to get to some good stuff. Right. Um, and that the contemporary um, landscape for new work is anti that because mm-hmm. we live in a society where if you don't succeed, you're garbage. Yeah, yeah. And so you can't allow the artistic risk proposition is difficult. And the other thing is, is it's gotten so professionalized that the money it costs to do these new things is astronomical. So no one wants to take a risk. So now you're not doing anything risky, right? And you have no ongoing relationship with the composer. You just have one commission. Mm -hmm. And that goes against all of the understanding of what led to masterpieces entering the canon. Yeah. Because they took risks, there was frequency, Mm -hmm. um, and there was relationships between the multi-project relationships between these composers um, and the producer. So we started, uh, we went to the Mellon Foundation in New York Mm -hmm. um, who had um, had some interest in us because of the American Repertoire Program. Right. And we started the largest residency program um, in the world for opera yeah. composers. Yeah. Um, and the idea was is that we would take um, uh, composers for three-year residencies, mm-hmm. that they would have had um, some body of work, um, but were just entering into opera, and that they would have potential for opera to be the substantial part of their artistic output. Mm. And we also wanted to have three composers at any one time in different stages of the three years because we wanted to change the DNA of the company. Yeah. And we wanted new work because we're basically up until then, we only produce stuff by dead guys. They're all guys (laughs) and they're all dead. Um, And we wanted to bring the living artists into the room. Yeah. Um, And so between our commissioning and our residency, we just became like this kind of go-to center Mm. for new work. Right. Uh, So you went into it with the knowledge that some of these works were going to flop. Well, well, so so no, no, because we knew that there couldn't be flops in the 21st century. Right. Um, Or we had to limit the flops. Yeah. Um, Because, you know, a composer writes their first opera and it's a flop. They just kiss it goodbye. Um, because there's just no attention span for anything that doesn't sort of look like massive success. Yeah, yeah. So the idea on the residency program was to sort of cheat that a bit. Okay. And it's not a commissioning program. Yeah. And there's no – there's there doesn't have to be any work that the public sees that comes out of the residency. It's hmm. sort of like a bespoke um, – uh, not training program, but experience program so that people, um, composers can develop their operatic voice and fill their toolbox. Right. And have lots of ideas and then have some car crashes, you know, because they worked with um, a librettist that didn't work out. Right. um, On a song cycle or a scene. Um, We, all of our um, composer rents, we paid for weekly voice lessons for the first year so that they could actually understand vocal production Mm -hmm. um, because the schools don't teach it. Right. Um, So so the the residency program was almost like a safe space for them to develop their ideas. Now, within that, there were ideas that we ultimately commissioned. So Breaking the Waves by Missy Mazzoli came out of the residency program. Right. Sky on Swings, which we did in 018, um, came out of a exercise in the residency that Lembit had about a newspaper article about two Alzheimer's patients that um, fell in love in an Alzheimer's home. Yeah. The opera ended up being something completely different, but that all started in the residency, but they were developed after and outside the residency. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and so, and you'll see like Renee Orth, um, it will have some work coming from us in the, in the future in terms of commission, Missy Mazzoli's being commissioned for another piece. Um, we're doing some work with David T. Little, yeah. um, David Hertzberg, we gave the Wake World, we're in dialogue with him about another piece, but all that came out of the residencies program. And so I think why our track record on the new work is so high, it's not 
that we're smart or better. It's that we have created an environment where artists can explore their voices. They can fail mm -hmm. early and often on small scale. Right. Um, so that when it comes to prime time in that commission, there's a ba uh, there's a sense of voice and purpose. Right, right, right. And then that's changed our whole commissioning program. So now, typically what happens is, you know, a producer says, oh, I want to commission a new work. And you go to the composer and you commission them. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. We do an exploration phase first. Mm -hmm. There's a whole memo, memo of understanding. There's exploratory money given, and the, uh, we've asked them to come up with a team. And then we pay, we give them money and resources to go away and think of an idea and come up with a treatment. And we talk about it. Yeah. And there's all that's done before we go to commission. The trick is with us that exploration isn't an audition mm. for the commission. We say we're going to commission you no matter what. We just don't know what the what is. Yeah. So let's take some exploratory time and think about that. Okay. And and that's led us to an understanding of our brand promise. So I'm going to bring my business thinking back into sure. this. Because I believe um, any successful company has a brand promise that's an unwavering commitment to their consumer that they will never break. So mm -hmm. it's not about your logo. It's not about the brochure or whatever. Um, and in an arts organization, you know, what is our unwavering promise yeah. to our stakeholders that we will never break? And our stakeholders are our audience, our donors, our s singers, our orchestra, our audience, um, the community at large. And so our brand promise is to excite artists and audiences in that order. Mm -hmm. That if we don't give the artists agency, resources, safe place, um, instigations for doing their most exciting work, yeah. the audience will never be excited. Right, right. And, and that is kind of inverse mm -hmm. of a lot of traditional logic. So here we are, we've got all these marketing analytics and we do all this sort of stuff, but it's not those analytics that are driving the content of the products that we're developing, that right. artists are doing that. Yeah. What we're using the research and the analytics for is how we package and distribute it to market. Okay, okay, got it. So, sorry, this went way inside my skull. <laughs> <laughs> no. Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> you, you've- Marketing uh, strategy class. <laughs> <laughs> So you've introduced a lot, a lot. It's a whole different world at Opera Philadelphia now, right? Mm -hmm. um, along the way, I'm sure there were a lot of skeptics. There probably oh, yeah. still are, and, and right? They still are. And the other thing is I don't want, whenever I do these sorts of things, I'm very, I can be very articulate, yeah. and I'm a great promoter of our work. Um, but we don't have everything figured out. And there are challenges around every corner. Right. So, to, you know, it's not a panacea of, you know, easy trend line. Right. Um, because we're disruptive intentionally yeah. and with disruption comes challenges. Um, and there's not so many naysayers now. There's some people that have left the company because it's not okay. for them. Yeah. Um, but we've gained more new people than we've lost. We have more new cu we have more customers mm -hmm. than we did um, in the baseline of 2010. Brilliant. Um, so net win. Um, where our challenges lie, quite frankly, is is paying for it all, because you know if you're a venture, if you're a startup in Silicon Valley, there is a whole host of. Um, uh, investors who are um, happily will take on risk. Right. The weird thing about philanthropy in this country is it's insanely risk averse. Mm. So you get all these people that make money from yeah. risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hedge funds and leverage and right. blah, 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 blah. Um, and, uh, and then it comes time to make a philanthropic investment and everybody wants to know that it's going to be successful. Um, and so one of our big challenges has been staying in front of what I call venture philanthropy and trying to find philanthropists that are happy to um, invest in what arguably is a startup. Right. Um, and uh, like in any cool new idea, the first round of investments easy to find. And so we were actually 
that was not a problem for us. Mm-hmm. Second round in financing, and second round investing right. in philanthropic dollars um, uh, remains and continues to be um, our our largest challenge. Okay. Um, because we're not the new idea, to put it in VC terminology, we're not um, net cash flow positive yet. And yeah. the reason is, is because we need three to five festivals to be successful and fully establish ourselves mm-hmm. as a um, market presence. Yeah. Because, you know, so you come to the festival, right? Presumably you liked it. Or we probably wouldn't be talking today. <laughs> oh, we're about to talk about that, David. <laughs> um, maybe you didn't. Uh, uh, um, but it engaged you some way. Yes. Um, let's say you're going to come back. Um, you know, but it's going to take three times for that to become part of your life. So that when you're looking at your September calendar, you're like, oh, what's going? I got to block out the O dates first. Right. Um, and um, and that's a prerequisite for people. Um, being philanthropists and investing in us, oh. and eighty percent of our revenue comes from philanthropy. So okay. to put that quality product on, only twenty percent comes from the box office. So we, so there's that time, yeah, lag, yeah. Um, and we're navigating it, but it's 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 not without its challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of like be careful what you wish for. Um, so I think a lot of people sort of go, hey, this is the cool disruptive people and they've got life easy. No, we're <laughs> disruptive and we continue to have to be creative and thoughtful and follow the analytics to find solutions mm-hmm. um, as we – because we're inventing a new business model. Um, and there's two sort of competing demands there. There's, you know um, – a traditional subscription season that lives in the Academy of Music and then this is festival and how do we sort of manage those two things concurrently. Right, right. okay. So in the... Uh, I have to ask you, what did you see in the festival? Sky on Swings. Wings. So good. <laughs> <laughs> good, 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 good. But awesome. I, I, you know, before we talk about Sky on Swings, I wanted to talk about um, Mr. Trump. How has... His election and his policies affected a company like Opera Philadelphia. Um, there are two big, two big takeaways from what I'll refer to as the political divide in America. Yes. Um, so um, one is we use a lot of international artists. Okay. Um, and so the new um, process for getting people visas that are not Americans um, has increased our costs and limited, and in some case limited talent. Okay. Um, we've mostly gotten through the talent, getting the talent, but the, definitely the costs mm-hmm. um, are extraordinarily high um, because you have to, you need to employ lawyers to get working visas for right. leading artists. So that's a, a that's a just a factual outcrop of a, a tightening. Um, around anything about a non-American coming in right here. Um, on the on the flip side, um, the tensions um, and um, a, a lot of hate being thrown around on both sides um, the aisles were um, has created a thirst, for people to have meaningful human relationships Mm -hmm. that are born out of love and understanding. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that in our audience. Um, And just the the need, this virtual, where we started this conversation, the virtuosity of the human voice touching our souls. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I think in the current environment, People are recognizing that as a ne- more of a necessity right. to manage their life, their way in the world, mm-hmm. rather than a luxury. Okay. Um, and so we're trying. What we're trying to do is to make um, sort of Opera Philadelphia a respite from just not political pressures, but you know everything that goes on, the bombardment of information, right, um, and stuff. And I, I just do. I do think that the um, the current political climate um, is um, making people take stock about what's important in their life. Mm-hmm. Um, and gee, I hope that 
singing um, can be a part of people's lives yeah. to help them sort of navigate that. My my husband's a, a Unitarian uh, chaplain, Unitarian okay. Universalist chaplain, and has worked, done a lot of work in trauma one hospitals. Mm-hmm. And so deals with really difficult situations. Yeah. And he uses opera as a time to restore himself. For sure. Um, and I think there's, because of the political climate, yeah. I think people find themselves <laughs> that aren't chaplains in trauma in hospitals feeling like <laughs> chaplains yeah. in trauma in hospitals um, that need, um, yeah. And then we've also made sure that we um, have a consistent commitment to working with artists from marginalized communities to give them voice. Right. So we've made a big commitment to African American um, uh, composers mm-hmm. in the past, and that continues um, with our um, drag opera that we did. Um, uh, we gave voice to um, uh, LGBTQ community and, in particular, non binary yeah. um, uh, artists. We were involved in that. Um, intentionally. Uh, and as we continue, you'll see a lot of our new work informed by voices from people um, that have in the past been marginalized by white European Western arts tradition, right. of which we come from. Yes, yes. So you, um, do you know how many of like the top arts executives in America are part of the LGBTQ community? Um, I don't. I would say management by walking around in opera, we are well represented <laughs> in <laughs> opera. Um, on, well, just to be clear, on um, the gay male side. So, yeah. um, but on the lesbian side mm-hmm. and certainly... Um, in the queer and or non-binary side. So the I think the arts has um, is well represented by largely white gay men yeah. who dress nice um, and play by the rules. Right, 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 right. Okay. So how do you think that's... <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> so I'm, when you say LGBTQ, yeah. I'm like, well, the G, but even the G doesn't even go on the on the queer side of that, if you were a gay, if you're a gay man and you, um, and the the, and you, I, being a, a queer is part of your identity. I don't think you're represented mm. in our field very mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly, I mean, we have a couple of colleagues like Cheska, who runs Washington National Opera, and uh, Glimmerglass is a lesbian um, and uh, has a lovely wife, um, but she's an anomaly. Right, right. So how does that affect your leadership and what you want to do in this industry? Yeah, so um, what we've come to, what we're having discussions about um, is um, making sure... How do I put? So, we want to be more than an ally, right? For um, people that are not represented in either management or artistic expression mm-hmm. in opera, um, what we'd like to do is be an accomplice. Okay. Um, and I, I'm taking that from a um, where speech <laughs> um, from the Unitarian Universalist. Uh, um, uh, convention this year, yeah. um, uh, which I would suggest anyone read. It's fantastic. Mm. Um, and it's about um, dealing with communities of color and trans community is the topic of the lecture. Um, but we've talked about to be an accomplice means that we have to actually give up something to create space yeah. for people that have not been welcome in the past. Right. Um, and so we're, as the leader we're just starting to navigate that. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm trying to um, get people to do and for me to do is to be clear about um, giving something up in order to make room. Right. So for example, residencies. Um, We are explicitly um, focused on finding um, black, African-American 
um, creators, composers mm -hmm. um, in the next a couple of years of residencies. Right. And, it, and that is having to give something, to stop doing something in order to make space yeah. for that thing. Because we really believe we're in Philadelphia and we can't be of Philadelphia and not give African-American artists an opportunity to add to the canon of work. Yeah. For sure. Period. For sure. Um, uh, we actually have great representation of women composers. Um, mm. And so we don't have, that's not a blind spot for us. So we don't, it's just part of what we do. Yeah. So we don't have to give anything up for that. Okay. Um, uh, so um, uh, that's just an example. So I think how do I do that as a white um, gay Man, yeah. um, how to as a leader? <laughs> what do I do? Um, that's my answer: is to mm. try to try to do that in everything, in programming, community initiatives, um, in everything we do. So, for example, um, we took "We Shall Not Be Moved," which mm -hmm. we world premiered in 017, and we traditionally do opera on the mall. We broadcast an opera as part of the fest each fall, yeah. um, and it's always like. Traviata or Bohem, right. Carmen, something, or something traditional. Yeah, and this year we chose to do "We Shall Not Be Moved," um, and it's a tough piece. Yeah, um, you know, it uses um, it uses tough language. It deals with tough racial issues, um, and certainly does not fit into the family friendly programming of the Marriage of Figaro. Right. So we gave something up to make space. Yes. For this voice and this amazing thing happened that you know over 40 percent of the people that came on the mall were um, people of color um which had never happened that's before. never happened never that's never like, ever happened not just at opera but just anytime no one if if your uh, ancestors were enslaved by a country you're not showing up at the liberty bell right right so um, that that's what I talk about. That's becoming an accomplice. Mm. That's not just saying, oh, I believe that you have rights. It's, and I believe you have a voice. It's actually giving you the voice. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So well, that, that's what we're trying. And we're going to fail miserably, but we're going to try. We're going to try. All right. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. So the last thing, let's talk about Sky on Swings. Let's. Um... Scott Swings, for those who weren't there, is it, is it going to travel? Um, well, it's interesting because a lot of our work gets picked up after we do it okay. because some of it's pretty – you know, progressive, and yeah. a lot of people were afraid of the topic. Right. So we're waiting to hear. We we think it's going. We, there are a lot of people interested in it, but we haven't any. We do not have signed contracts yet. Well, listen. If you're in a position <laughs> to sign these contracts, do it because Sky on Swings. Um, yeah, we got to give props first. Composed by Lembit Beecher. Um, Amazing guy. Directed by... Joanna, Joanna Settle. Settle. And the libretto is by Hannah Moskowitz. Correct. Yes? A fellow Canadian. A fellow Canadian. Who's <laughs> <laughs> in Halifax. <laughs> but, you know, personally, it's, it's about um, two women who develop Alzheimer's, right? And it asks the question... Can this is forgetting right. be graceful Correct. ever? Yeah. Right? Is there beauty? Can there be beauty and dignity in forgetting? In forgetting. And personally, I uh, I've always been very terrified of Alzheimer's. It's I I see people who have it and like they have relationships with family members and loved ones that are going through that. And it's very, very tough for me to see that, like, someone f lose this memory. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful yeah. thing, right? Um, so Well, our minds are the best thing we've got. Right, right. So I've always been very terrified of mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. So I, I didn't know what to expect yeah. going into it. And I must say that you know, I'm not only saying this because you're in front of me, but it's really, it was really a powerful experience. I'm just glad to hear that. To see it's um, these people, these two main characters, right? 
they obviously it doesn't negate the fact that they're going through Alzheimer's and it's a terrible thing yeah. and for their families, yeah. right? But they like begin a new life as like new people almost together, right? Bonded, right? In love, yeah. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, it was really incredible. And, and, and what for me, what I think helped in that was, um, first of all, it's brilliantly written by Lembit and Hannah. Yeah. And I think you know, there, uh, the music and there's like instruments trying to connect to each other, but not um, in the orchestration, like what's going on in the mind. So it creates this confusion almost. Right. Um, and then there are moments it comes together. But the other big thing, and this has to do with Joanna, the director, and her doing this modernist, minimal setting is, you know, uh, Frederica von Stade, mm-hmm. who's 72, mm-hmm. and Marietta Simpson, who's in her mid to late 60s. Um, you know, these two women... Um, possess a lifetime of communicating on a stage. Right. And, but this is the first time anything's been written for them. Mm. You know, they've done all the dead guy stuff. Right. So, um, so what I think was so graceful about how it was produced is it let that lifetime of being and mm-hmm. performance enter the room. Right. So in that moment when the two of them are sitting with their legs dangling over the yeah. apron into the orchestra yeah. pit and no one's breathing in the theater, mm. right? Like everyone's, and they're just sitting. Mm. And you feel their lifetime of humanity as people. Right. Not, they're not just actors on a stage. Yeah. Um, for me was really... Um, just a height of live performance art. Yeah. Um, and and because they're dignified people mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they navigate their lives in this mature, dignified, thoughtful way, right. that read through. And it was written that way too. Yeah. But it was all that combination. Um, and, I'm, and I'm also thrilled that I think we've brought a piece into the canon that um, other artists, women artists, um, towards the end of their professional careers will have, it will provide an opportunity for them yeah, to that's have, another thing. have a, a, a dignified and great performance capstone. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I was just uh, reading an interview with Wendy Whalen, I think, yeah. who was the former uh, principal dancer of the New York City Ballet. And she... Uh, you know, ballet has a short shelf life. Very. <laughs> and she's someone that um, was forced out of the company because of her age and then eventually came back at the age of 47 and she retired on her own terms. Right. And it's really great to see that you as a company, you're developing work that these older singers, you know, obviously right. singers don't have that kind of shelf life. Right. But still, it's uh, it tends to like trend toward the younger, right? Completely, you know? and you know that goes back to where we were talking about giving um, voice to marginalized communities, right. and it doesn't have to be um, about um, exclusive to race and gender expression. Yeah, um, there's also an ageist right um, uh, dynamic going on mm-hmm. in our world for sure, um, and you know we once. Um, held our elders in esteem yeah. um, and as the leaders and the pillars of our community, and we don't anymore. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a very youth-driven culture. So right. I think Sky on Swings is an example to your earlier question about, you know, what are you doing <laughs> mm. as a somewhat privileged white guy yeah. um, to lead an organization to give voice to others. And right. it's a good example. And they were also, we intentionally made sure that they were, um, each uh, each of the characters, um, they were of different races. Mm-hmm. We wanted that. And it, it wasn't a political statement. It was just we wanted a reality yeah. of that's our world. Right. Yeah, it was, it was awesome because... 
you know, uh, there was so much diversity on stage mm-hmm. because Charlene Joint, who uh, did the daughter, yeah, yes, she did the daughter, is half Asian, yes. right? Yeah, so and she was the daughter of the black woman, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of diversity. Yeah, and it was really... it was colorblind in that sense. Yeah, but um, yeah, because that's the world we live in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been really awesome. Um, how, when can when and how can people see Opera Philadelphia's next work? So we have the next work is Midsummer Night's Dream. It's in February. Okay. Um, it's um, an amazing opera um, written by one of the s- successful 20th century composers, right. um, Benjamin Britten. Um, it is a stunning production by Robert Carson. Mm. It's like the quintessential production in the world. Um, and it'll come here in February, so they can go online. Operafilla.org um, is where everything is. And while they're there, they might want to just sign up uh, for our mailing list because in February we'll be announcing next season and 019. Um, and that way you can get to the front of the line um, yes. as we announce um, next year's festival. As okay, well. I got to do that too. <laughs> well, thank you so much, David. Oh, thank you. I it's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs>